Welcome back to the Buzz Bubble and the Three Minute Buzz. Our next series is with a panel of brilliant experts in marketing and customer service. Joining us today will be Peter Shankman, best-selling author of Nice Companies Finish First. Peter's also a consultant who's worked with such brands as Disney, NASA, Snapple, and American Express. We also have Dr. Bob Deutsch, author of The Five Essentials. He's a cognitive anthropologist and helps brands relate to their customers and just figure out the way real people think. Dr. Bob has worked with brands like Coke, Dunkin' Donuts, MasterCard, and Mini. Also with us today is Deb Zemaransky. 34-year veteran of the Disney leadership team. Deb's also a consultant who helps brands find their own service culture. She helps develop the leadership teams and the processes that create positive creative culture. We'll be discussing customer experience, loyalty, brand evangelism, and how these things actually happen. So stick with us for the next few weeks as this series unfolds in buzzable, bite-sized, three-minute chunks. Let's go meet the panel. Well, great. Thanks for everybody for coming down uh, today. I really appreciate your time. Uh, with us today, we have Peter Shankman, Dr. Bob Deutsch, and Debbie Zimoransky, which I get that name right you all the time. say right? it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here to talk about the customer, the consumer, or as Dr. Bob I know likes to call them, people. Um, from loyalty to experience to attachment. So why don't we jump in and talk a little bit about loyalty. I know you have some strong feelings. Uh, I'm going to direct this first one to Dr. Bob to start us off about customer loyalty. Well, I mean, if you consider customer loyalty to be a person who very much likes a product and repeatedly buys it, you can say that's customer loyalty. But things can get complicated pretty quickly. Uh, I'll give you an example. That's to me a representative sample of something that's generally out there. I was recently speaking to a person who is uh, a lifetime loyalist of Audi. Okay, four Audi cars over almost 18 years. Four new Audi cars. Loves it. Talks it up to everyone. Couldn't be happier as this person describes it. And it seems authentic. Uh, then one day, recently, a friend of his comes to visit him and says, I just got a new BMW, take it for a ride. So he does, he likes it, and that was that. And then he reports to me, uh, well, the end of that week, I went to my local BMW dealer to really take a test drive and really test it. You know, and he said it with such relish. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, at the end of that visit, he bought the BMW. So I said to him, well, that's great. You know, they're probably, you consider them both good cars. But uh, how do you go from all the years with Audi, especially how you've been talking about it, and then seemingly on a flip of a dime, <coughs> uh, change? Right. Uh, he said, I drove the car, and I really experienced it as the ultimate driving machine. He, he says it. The tagline to you. <laughs> I mean, he says, it handles, it actually handles much better than my Audi. That's why I bought it. So I said, well, what happened to loyalty? And he literally laughed in my face. Wow. You know? He said, we're not talking about people. We're talking about things. <laughs> Is it so different? I, I think, you know, well, I think, you have loyal friends that last for eight years, last for four years, last, last a life. Well, I think, I think the issue is if we think about people just as consumers, we, we immediately could buy into this idea of customer loyalty to a brand or a product. But if you think about people as people, brand is not the end all be all meaning of life. Yeah. You know, it's, it's actually a trivial thing. So I think we get sort of bogged down with, right. with, with our own perspective, so to speak. Brand, I mean, brand is nothing to sneeze at, but it's also not godly. Yeah. Now, Peter or, or Dad, uh, any take on loyalty and where, where it really falls in the, 
scheme of things. Well, there's a word that I like better than loyalty because loyalty, I, and, and Bob just gave a great example, loyalty is, is more of an action that people take. I buy Audis. Something else comes along, I may defect in a heartbeat, either for a better price or because I've decided I like this product better. I prefer the term commitment. If you're really talking about folks who come back to you again and again and again, those are the people who are committed to your brand and they're committed to whatever it is that you're doing that has created uh, usually some kind of an emotional attachment. Whereas I always said, for example, that I was loyal to a particular airline and then one day I got in the mail an offer for a free ticket and some other perks and I switched in a heartbeat. I went, the next flight I booked was on this other airline. So loyalty is more like an action but which I think what you're really after is that commitment from people that says, no matter what, I do business with you because, to, to Bob's point, you're dealing with people. And so you have to touch it at the people level in order to get folks to come back again and again and again to do business with you. And that usually means creating some type of an emotional connection, which loyalty doesn't always do. Right. I think that, that in terms of loyalty, commitment, both of which are, 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 are great devices uh, in terms of getting repeat customers, take a step back. Why are we loyal to a brand or to a company? Not a person, but a brand or a company or an, uh, a, a, a thing we do. I, I am Global Services and United. They treat me beyond compare. And I know that they treat me better than the guy who flies to see grandma twice a year. And they have to because I spend a lot more money. Right. Now, why am I loyal to United? They treat me really well. I know that there'll be a solution to any problem I have. I know they're not nickel and diming me. I spend more. But it doesn't come in the form of, oh, sir, you're going to have to check that bag and pay $50. It comes in the fact that I bought a more expensive flight, which could have been cheaper on another airline, but I didn't because I'm going to be treated well. Now, if you take even ste a step back even further from that, think about the last customer interaction you had with a business. It could have been a restaurant. It could have been dry cleaners, whatever. Chances are it was crap. <laughs> right. We have become a society that expects to be treated like crap. Crap is the norm. The bar is crap. <laughs> if you can treat your customers or clients one level above crap, it doesn't even have to be good. One level above crap, and they'll be pleasantly surprised. Two to three levels above crap, they will go out of their way to come back and bring people back. It's the concept of empathetic connections, of creating a connection with someone that says, you know what, I notice you're not just a customer, you're Peter. You're not a number, you're a real person. I always talk about the Morton Steakhouse thing when they showed up at the airport with, with a steak for me. But here's the problem. That was an amazing stunt. And it wasn't planned. And I give them all the credit in the world for pulling it off. I had no idea it was going to happen. I stake my entire professional reputation on, on that. Uh, that was, I had, was not involved other than sending the tweet. That's not scalable. Morton's job is not to bring steak to the airport for people. But here's where it gets interesting. Every time anyone calls Morton's and says, like to make a reservation. They go, great, we'll see you at Friday at 8 o'clock. Are you celebrating anything? They ask that question. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's my, it's my assistant's birthday. Oh, what's her name? Her name's Megan. Okay, great, we'll see you there. Show up, we, sit, we get to our table, we sit down, there's the menu, and on top of the menu it says, happy birthday, Megan, and she spends the next 45 minutes Instagramming the crap out of that thing, <laughs> and I can't get a drink. So she has shared that sentiment, and she has shared her loyalty and her love, and I, I'm probably, I'm probably blowing the lead of the story too early, but my belief is that within 48 months, friending, fanning, following, and liking are going to disappear. Okay, If you go into Google Maps right now and you Google steakhouses near me, they come up with eh, a dozen steakhouses right in this you know, three block radius. Anyone who's in your Google Plus network who's been to a steakhouse there, and who the sentiment of that visit has been positive, whether it's been a positive Instagram photo, whether it's been just what they've said, that's going to show up first. The people in your network are going to start making the recommendations for you. So it's not going to be about advertising. It's not going to be about marketing. I don't, I don't need to like a restaurant online that I go to twice a week. It's pretty obvious I go to a steakhouse a lot. Look at me. Okay? <laughs> I don't need to first go and like that steakhouse online. The fact that I'm there and that my phone knows I'm there geographically. That there is enough for them to market to me. If they do something stupid and I stop going there, their ability to reach me will be declined as well. And if we're not friending, we're not following, and we're not liking, then all a company has to differentiate themselves between every other company out there is customer service. 
because how they make that person feel will translate for every future customer down the line based on if I have 100 people in my network and I want to know what restaurant to go to when I'm in Fiji next month. I might not have a friend of mine who's ever been to Fiji in my network, but someone in, their, in my friend's network might have. That's a connection of trust. They will recommend it and I'll believe them because you're a friend of her and I know her. If you screw me, you've screwed both of us. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the concept of trust is where, is where social and customer service are going to meet. You know, I've taught, I think we've touched on something here that's the, an underlying important issue, which is the unexpected. Mm -hmm. I think that's critical in terms of customer experience. And I, I think there, there's almost like a societal reason beyond, the, which is very true. The baseline is, it's crap. Um, everyone is so busy. Everyone experiences the world as too fast, too complex, too competitive. And it's like, we're all, we're all we have so many external and internal demands mm -hmm. that uh, we're quickly out of breath. We quickly lose touch, I would say, with with our own feelings. You know, we're just doing. You know, and anything that can help you stop, focus on feeling yourself is is a huge experience, and that's the surprising, the new the unexpected, things that tap into your feelings, people, uh, things that make you feel maybe a little curious about something. You go beyond the normal, you know? That, that really is something. And I think it leads to an implication, which is most companies want customers, consumers, what I like to call people, experience the company, you know, the company's products, the company's stores, the company's websites, the company's everything. Uh, I think nowadays what people want is for companies to help people experience themselves more. So, th so you have to really turn the dial 180 degrees. I think that's a real issue. A great example of that, um, you know, everyone talks about empowering the employee to help the customer. But I think that when you empower an employee to help, when you say to an employee, you can, you can go out of your way to do something for the customer, if you have to give them that permission or almost make it a task for them, then it's not a customer service issue anymore, it's a hiring issue. Ritz-Carlton goes through a huge process to hire their employees because they don't want just anyone, they want someone who wants to help, who actually wants to be there and wants to solve problems. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, my, my favorite two stories involve two of the biggest guys, Verizon and Hertz. You know, I, I land in Dubai, and I have global roaming on my phone, and, and in three minutes, I get a text that I've spent $300. I'm like, okay, something's wrong. I call, you know, back to the U.S. I get George or whatever at the call center, and he's like, he's like oh, yeah, you have global roaming, but it doesn't work in Dubai. <laughs> okay. It's so part of global, though. It's, it's, it's kind of it's more like hemispherical. Right? It's like yeah. hemispherical roaming. But, but, okay, so I'm here for a week. What can you do for me? You have my credit card. Bill me a thousand bucks. Give me a couple of gigs of data. I'm fine with that. It, sorry, sorry, I can't do that. You know, it's going to be $20.48 a megabyte. I'm like, okay, you're obviously high. And I went and I bought the same phone unlocked and bought a SIM card with 25 gigs of data for like 50 bucks. And I was fine. Mm -hmm. Had he been empowered, to, to help me. Say, you know what, Pete's been with Verizon for 11 years, he's had like 35 phones, he goes overseas all the time, I'm gonna do this for him. Because it's gonna, now I have an international unlocked phone that I carry with me whenever I go overseas, I haven't Verizon a penny. So, and on the flip side of that, if you hire the lowest common denominator, that's what you're gonna get. And it, it, the two are diametrically opposed. I, I, I studied this when I wrote Nice Companies Finish First. You're diametrically opposed because you wanna hire cheapest labor you can, but the cheapest labor you can is often going to screw you in the long haul because when I was at Hertz and 40 minutes waiting on the preferred line because my name was on the board, went upstairs to the main, um, main thing, another 40 minutes, finally I get at the counter and the guy says, you know, sorry, we can't, uh, I, can, I can only help you, you're, you're preferred, you have to go back downstairs. I'm saying, oh, it's, okay, what it's the same computer system, so you can do this, I, I believe in you, and he's like, he's like, sorry. So I walk across, this is Phoenix, where they're all connected, I walk across to Avis. I, I would rather sit on a bus made of razor blades and drive it through a lemonade waterfall than ever rent from Hertz again. And when I wrote about this in my blog, Avis reached out and said, hey, we really, you know, have two things, we've heard before, that a lot, we've gotten a lot of new customers who come over from Hertz to Avis and Phoenix, and, and, and we noticed that you, you, you rent sometimes. We're giving you chairman's preferred whatever 
we hope you'll. They took me from just a regular pissed off customer and turned me into a loyalist. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm going to tell you, you know, when I, every time I go into a city, I'm going to rent from Amos because my car will always be in spot A1. It'll always be a BMW or something like that. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all, and all they had to do was empower the employee. I didn't have a reservation when I walked up to them. The employee said, you know, don't worry about it. We'll get you in the car. Yeah. Done. Five minutes. And that, that immediacy of, take it. I don't need you to read from a script. I just need you to say, you know what, Pete? You got a problem, we're going to fix it. Yeah. Don't tell me how. I don't need to know what you're doing. I just need to know that you're going to fix it. And companies that empower their employees to do that Right. Not only make a lot more money, but actually save a lot more money. Yes. As well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think there's a what an implication here too, which is put your money against hiring the right people and forget training. Exactly. You know, right. you can't train a person to be responsive, a real human being, initiatory, helpful. You know, but I would say, a person walks into a room, you're interviewing them for a certain kind of customer service job, mm -hmm. right. you know within three seconds <laughs> if that person is capable of doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There doesn't have to be a half hour interview. So two things Peter said, and I'm going to turn it over to Deb because I know she has a lot to talk about uh, onboarding and hiring and, and so, so two things there that you and Hertz were obviously not a person. You were I was a number. the next caller, exactly. you know, right. if you had known how long you had been there or, or Verizon. But they, that's, they shouldn't years. even needed to. They, because I don't, want, I don't want special service because I have a blog or because I have 200,000 Twitter followers. I want to feel special because I, they, the company that I give my money to, I want them to want to make me feel special for no other reason than it's good business. And then you, you indicated a culture. You're going to hire into a culture. Yeah. The company's got to have a culture if that culture is service. So I'm going to turn it over to Deb, 35 plus years at Disney and beyond, and you yeah. know, they know how to do that. They do know how to do that. Most premier organizations, you mentioned Ritz, Nordstrom's, I mean, the people you always hear about, Southwest, Disney, they know that it's about hiring for the culture. So when we talk about right fit hiring, Disney's philosophy is we hire for attitude, not for aptitude. I can train you to do just about anything I need you to do. Uh, unless it requires some special license or certification, I'm looking at you, to Bob's point, I'm looking at you to say, will you be able to deal with our guests? Will you be able to take care of the guests? We'll give you the parameters and we'll give you the leeway to be empowered, Disney does. You, you can get out there and take care of the guests, but you have to be the right type of person mm -hmm. who's going to want to do it, thrive yeah. on doing it, know how to do it, be able to make good decisions. So Disney's always looking to hire for that. I want to go back, too, to something that Bob said earlier, and he said, you know, it's about people. Customers now, it's all about them. They don't care how you make it happen, and price is not usually an issue. One thing we know at Disney, and honestly, if you price out any type of, let's say, tourist attraction, it's outrageous. Price is never an issue for Disney, and they'll tell you this, unless we don't deliver on the magical experience. Mm -hmm. We don't get complaints. When I worked for Disney, we didn't get complaints about price unless Disney messed up yeah. and didn't fix it and didn't make it right or just didn't deliver on that emotional feeling that people expect to have because it's about expectations. Much of it's about expectations. There's a, a great book called Peak, how great companies get their mojo from Maslow and they've got a, a Maslow type of triangle in this book and it's called called the Maslow of customer service. And the very bottom half, you know, where Maslow would have basic needs, it says meet expectations. If you're meeting your customer's expectations, you are barely staying alive. You're, you are not even maintaining competitive advantage. If you're exceeding customer expectations, you, you will have some success. It's when, as you said, that you surprise and meet unrecognized expectations, those surprises. I had a rental car company, uh, rented a car for my daughter while she's here in town and my grandkids, and we were supposed to turn it back on Monday. Both her and I thought we had checked it on Tuesday, just being a couple of dingbats, you know. Take it back on Tuesday to this small little budget place that I always go to, and he said, you, you know this was supposed to be back yesterday, and I said, oh my gosh, I mean, I felt ridiculous and and they always give me such great service and they'd given us an SUV for a, a, a car price and a, you know great stuff so I said how much more do I you just put it on the credit card he said no don't worry about it doesn't seem like a big thing but an entire day of rental free so and that's empathy. I wasn't expecting right. that and so 
those are the kinds of little things, and it's often not huge things, but your employees have to be hired, you have to hire a right fit, and then you have to have a culture that supports them. So not only do you give them the parameters and the information to do what they need to do, you then reward them when they do it well, coach them when they do it wrong, and, and so forth. And, then, and I just have one more thing to say about customer service before we move on, because I think this is where there's a huge, where companies really get into trouble. In poll after poll, the average percentage is that 80% of companies think that they're delivering, and now it's 88, 88. it goes, <laughs> think they're delivering 80 80. Yep. superior, 88, yes, think they're delivering superior service to customers. 8% of the customers believe they don't get any type of superior service. How can you run a company and not be any more connected to your customers than that? And it's because companies go around thinking, we know what the customers want, and they don't bother to take the time they think about them as customers, not they as think people. about them as customers, not as people. They don't take the time to find out what is it that really gets you excited about doing business with us. What is it that really makes you loyal? What are the things that we do or don't do that would make you come back again and again? You know, so and companies don't take the time to find out. One of the funny things I hear from people about customer service, a complaint, mm -hmm. is too scripted, yeah. you know? Uh, some person once called it, for me, feigned intimacy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and most people talk about bank service like that, in-bank service, you know? I went to deposit a check, people say, for example, and all of a sudden, I got an interview. How's your summer going? Where are you planning to go on vacation? You know, uh, you have kids going off to call? And people, I'm t you know, I'm interviewing some of the same. What is this person, why does he think I'm going to divulge my life story to him? You know? right. Well, you but know, they're, they're reading off a script. Yeah, they're reading off a script. Statistics show that in social media, or beginning to show, it's kind of new, in social media customer service that you know companies are now tracking what their customers are out there saying on tweet, but customers don't want you to respond to every one of their tweets. In fact, there's a higher mm. percentage, like 41%, mm. that consider this an invasion of privacy. Well. I want to talk about you, but I don't necessarily want an answer unless I tweet that I that I need help or well, that that's I want where the issue is. The, the, yeah. the key it, is, you know, people want to. They actually do want to feel recognized by the company. If uh, if I share a photo of a whatever a, a plane, a United plane in the sunset as I'm waiting at the airport, United usually replies saying, "Wow, great photo, thank you, Peter. Have a great flight." Okay, sure. and, and it's nice. Here's this multi-billion-dollar company saying hi to Peter. Okay. On the flip side, um, if I have an issue with a company and I tweet about it and I don't hear back from them, well, why bother having an account? Right. Why bother being on Twitter? Because now you've given me an you, you basically you say, hey, how can we help you? And I say something, and then you say, no. We're just talking. So, but taking a step back, in terms of, in terms of the customer as a whole, so we just, we just finished a major implementation for a, for a, a major US airport. Um, the problem, and a, a good airport terminal is essentially a mall where planes go, <laughs> right? <laughs> Nowadays, yes. Yeah. So this, this airport in this terminal has 144 retail locations, and 78,000 people pass through it every day. Um, and there's 78,000 very, very pissed off people because the majority of them have just had an anal probe from the TSA, and their flight is delayed, and they're angry. How do you get 78,000 angry people to want to shop with you? That was the task we were, my, my company was faced with. And so we interviewed all the employees at both the, the, the restaurants and the, the retail outlets, and what we found is that the biggest problem they had is the, the reason everyone said there was such bad customer service there was because the employees hated, talk, hated dealing with people who were on their phones. I get that, you know, and there's signs in New York restaurants, you walk into a New York restaurant, please get off your phone before you order. Yeah, right. Here's the problem though, you walk into an airport, the last, that's the last time you're gonna be in contact for six hours, 14 hours, whatever, right. you have to be in your phone. So rather than try to convince the, the customer to change, we convinced the airport to change. And in two weeks, we're launching the world's first cell phone friendly airport, where all the restaurants are at, will have big signs, if you're on your phone, stay on your phone, we'll work with you. Right on wipe off boards, where you can circle what you wanna eat, and the best part, we convinced the owners of the airport to give all their employees discretion. So the employees now have the ability to go up and say, you know, at a restaurant, to give them a card that says, sounds like a really tough call. Your next drink's on me. You know, or, would you, you know, you, you said your flight's in 35 minutes. So you walk in, the first thing you say, when's your flight? 
right there, that tells you, I care. You know, if, you, if your flight's in 20 minutes, you're not gonna be able to get a, 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 a steak cooked well done, but we're gonna get you a shrimp appetizer, we're gonna get you this and that. And so, and when we tested this, we saw 11% increase in revenue and 21% increase in tips. So how can no you surprise. be empathetic, again, empathetic to the customer's specific situation, which is, I'm cranky, I'm pissed off, my flight's late, and I have a lot of crap that I have to carry. What can you do then? And, and to not only make them happy, but to generate a higher percentage of revenue, blew our minds. So it's gonna be a fun launch. It's gonna be mm -hmm. a, a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah. trying to change consumer behavior, which you're not gonna do. You're not gonna do that. You won't change consumer change behavior. Change no. what you do to yep. exactly. Right. Consumers will continue. Not even a second thought for yep. most brands. No, it isn't. And consumers will just continue to move around and defect until they so find exactly. the company yeah. that does deal with their particular behavior. They're not gonna change their behavior for you, they're just going to change companies exactly. that they deal with. Do you know in the, in the 60s, to change a bank, it took three weeks and, and no less than eight visits. And if you were a woman, forget it, you had to bring your husband. T today, <laughs> right. TD Bank, on their homepage, switch to us button. You uh -huh. click that button, two clicks, your money's over. Pain has always been that pain of switch. Yeah. Change has always yeah. been with banks. And a lot of when, when I speak to business audiences, I, I have, so, well, uh, recently I've changed my mantra from people, not consumers, to the following simple sentence. You have to understand people, and your products have to fit into people's lives. People's lives don't have to fit into your company. So you better damn well know something about people and people's lives and right. how they experience their life. That's right. And you know, it, it really takes 180 degree reorientation. Yes. Out to the world, to people, versus just thinking about you, the company, the product, the offering. Yeah. I just remember we're going to say thank you for not saying a 360 degree change. Because yeah. I, I was at a conference yesterday or two days ago, and I said, we have to make a 360 degree change. I, I, That's I, no I just stood back. Did you realize that brings you right back to where you started? I was so angry. <laughs> <laughs> That's me off so much. Full circle. <laughs> so Peter, you had mentioned, I don't know if it was a real world story, but Megan taking her out, she's this slight upgrade of, I recognized your birthday, I put her on it, and she's tweeting. So some may call that brand evangelism. Let's talk a little bit about that. and and. You know, some people say that it doesn't exist except for those 1% brands, the Harleys, the Apples, the, you know, the, the, those top echelon, the BMWs and Audis. Um, but you described, you know, not everybody in the world knows them. More. In the mid frankly, Joe's Steakhouse could have done the same thing. Yeah. In the Midwest, there is, a, there is a gas station slash 7-Eleven type company called The Come and Go. Okay, anyone, if you've ever lived in Iowa or anywhere like that, you know Come and Go. K-U-M-A-N-D-G-O. And their tagline is, I know, I know. And their tagline is always something extra. Okay, which makes it even worse. I know. Yikes. You have <laughs> never <laughs> seen, they have about, they have about 150, 150 stores in the Midwest. You have never seen a more loyal brand, a loyal cu customer base, than the people who go to Come and Go and they, they I just got my, 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 Slurpee, I got whatever. God, I love this place. They're hot dogs. This is great. They have, and this is it's a, it's a it's a it's a gas station. So how do you think this? That, is because happening? every single employee is trained to be nice. They're trained to be nice. They're trained to say, "How can I help?" When you get gas, to your point, you think they were hired to be nice. Yeah, well, that's what I'm nice. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I rephrase it. They were hired. They were nice, and so they were hired. And they're a gas station. So. Whenever I talk to businesses, I have a, a sh shameless plug, I have a book coming out in February, my, my fourth book, uh, it's called Zombie Loyalists. And it's all about turning the customer, making the customers you have deliver the customers you want. You know, mm -hmm. the biggest problem I see is, is companies, they, you know, we're at, um, at 9,999 followers, a 10,000 follower gets a prize. Translate that to screw you, original 9,999 followers, we don't care about you. It's like bringing the girl to the dance and, and look at a better dealer the second you get there. If you focus on the customers you have with these little tiny things, these little insignificant things that cost you nothing, but again, bring the person back from being a number, that brings you that level of loyalty. You know, for me, there are, there's a, a deli uh, a block away from me. There's, I live on 42nd and 9th. There are 18 delis within you know, a 30-foot radius. But the one on 42nd and 9th, the guy knows that I like, the, when, I, when I have my sandwiches, I like the, the lettuce really, really shredded, and he remembers that. And I don't have to ask him, and I'll always go to that deli. Sure, you always go back? Always. 
Easiest thing in the world. It's almost always the, the little things. It's very exactly. It's in, and anybody can do it. You don't have to be a huge recognized brand. Anybody can do it. Totally. And then the other thing that, that managers, CEOs, executives, leaders of organizations have to understand is that they are not the people that have the biggest influence on the customer. It's the frontline employees who look that person in the eye, smile, say, I can do that for you, and I'm happy to do that for you. And managers are, are always taking credit, saying, oh, we built this culture. And maybe they built the culture, but unless it's delivered on by those frontline people, it's meaningless. But amazing, anybody can do that. It takes five. It takes every single employee to make the brand more successful. It takes one employee to kill it. Yep. Yeah. It's amazing how easy it is to give people a good experience and how much of that experience is lacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that has to come down. I mean, again, if you go with you go in with the assumption, I leave my apartment every day with the assumption that everyone in the world sucks. <laughs> you know, and then it's just very easy. You know, it makes life very simple. I, I, everyone, my my kid, my wife, and my cat are the three people in the universe that don't suck every morning when I leave. And and sometimes it's just my kid and my wife. Sometimes it's just the cat. <laughs> Most of the time, it's just the cat. But when I when I leave, you know, any with if I'm walking around with that baseline. Dude, just smile at me and you'll win me over. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I don't need anything take much. else. Just no. smile for God's sake. I mean, that's yeah. not that's a trivial. New York. That's yeah. not a trivial behavior. It's not. Smile, eye contact, right. responsiveness, yeah. simple responsiveness. It's right. like basic. Now, when you were at Disney, did they teach that? You know, we talked about when I was in the, the uh, training with you, we talked mm -hmm. about uh, you can hear a smile on the phone. Mm -hmm. How do you? teach that how do you you know i know you got to hire to, to hire yeah it goes right back to rights at hiring but when it doesn't happen then there has to be accountability so yeah. it's not only right fit hiring, then you give folks parameters. Disney had what they called service standards. And these standards, there were seven of them, kept them on a little card, and those were the things that managers knew that they held people accountable for when it came to guest interaction. And they were simple things like make eye contact and smile. That was number one, in fact. Yeah. Um, display appropriate body language at all times, right? Um, you know, so it was those things. We don't lean on trash cans. We don't, you know, fold our arms. All of those things. And they had just seven of these simple little service guidelines. And they made sure that every single cast member, that's their employees, knew what those seven service guidelines were they train them to understand this is what it looks like in your job if you're scooping ice cream on Main Street this is what it looks like to demonstrate the seven service guidelines if you are working IT in a back office this is what it looks like so they give you all of the information but then what it really boils down to is accountability and you know we always say if you go to Disney often enough you will eventually meet a disenchanting cast member and uh, they don't last very long and they are usually asked very quickly to find their happiness elsewhere Elsewhere. But, it, you know, and they, and they hold to that line. And it, so it is about hiring right fit. And then it is about giving them everything they need to be successful. But the third thing that so many companies don't do well because managers tend to shy away from it is that accountability piece. And it's every single supervisor's, managers, and executive's responsibility to not only role model the seven service guidelines themselves, but then to hold the employees accountable. Those who are not doing it. It, ha there has to be some consequences for the action, right? And uh, because when you're driving loyalty, it's, it's the simple things like we said, and, and we know from polls and from studies that there are three, two or three just basic drivers of loyalty. And then you have to figure out how they fit into your culture. And the first is delivering on the experience. And the experience is every point of contact. If I go to your website, is it easy for me to find what I, what I need? Is it easy for me to purchase it? Is it easy for me to contact someone? If I go to a Disney theme park, do I enjoy that experience of the omelet? Ambiance, the environment, the contact with, with the people. So it looks like different things to different companies, but you have to deliver on the experience. And not just what you believe to be the experience, but what your customers are telling you is the experience that they expect and want from you every day. And then the other, the second big thing is to build relationships call people by name. It's as simple as things like that, you know, to, to learn your name, call you, call you by name whenever possible. If I'm checking someone in at a front desk, they have to give me their driver's license and a credit card. First thing I have is information to build that relationship. Hey, Mrs. Brown, oh my goodness, you came all the way from Florida. I'm so happy to have you here today. Isn't the weather beautiful, a lot cooler? Whatever that looks like. It, it, that, it doesn't really sound scripted, though. No, no it doesn't That's sound scripted. Yeah. And, it, and it can't be scripted. You can't say first, 
recognize them and say hello by name. Then it has to be people who can say, I'm interacting with another person, right? Exactly. This is person to person interaction. I'm not selling another night at the hotel. I'm interacting with the person who's doing business with us. And so there are real drivers of loyalty that are out there. Then you have to figure out what does it look like for me and my company when I'm delivering on the experience for my customer? What does it look like for me and my company when I'm building relationships? And so it becomes very specific, but the key drivers have been pretty much the same for decades. And there's one complication, I think. That's funny. I was going to say, why is it difficult? Why, why isn't this going well, on? Oh, it's company? easy. I, I would say it's, there's a complication that, that leads to how it might be difficult. It's one thing to, give peop to satisfy people's interests, give them what they want. But people's lists of what they want are endless. Mm. Okay? You could build situational satisfaction, but not enduring emotionally based satisfaction that way. And I think to get people to really buy into you as an idea, something has to be part of the mix which is beyond satisfying my interests, satisfying what's relevant to me. That's commodity. Yeah. You know? What you have to do is what we said before is give people something surprising, unexpected, and let them take that as a provocation to explore something about themselves and the experience that was beyond what they were there for. So it's, it's really a self-expansion issue. It's not a satisfaction with what's relevant in the status quo. In every, every morning, um, I pull 10 random names out of my Google contacts, I have like 6,000 contacts now, and I pull 10 random names out, and I send these 10 people an email every morning. It says, hey, you haven't, I haven't talked to you in however long. Every morning I email 10 people, you're on my list today. What are you working on? How can I help? Simple. I get about a 60% response rate, and, and five out of those six, without fail, I can't believe you sent that email. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> the best part is when they think they're forwarding it to someone and they accidentally buy, he obviously has a motive. I don't know what it is, but he obviously wants something. What do you think he wants? <laughs> and then I said, well, actually, all I really wanted to teach you the difference between reply and forward. But, you know, Valuable it lesson. comes back to the fact that we don't expect anything for nothing, right? Right. And if you can give them something for nothing, you know, I, I, on my... On my website and on all my emails it says you want 10 minutes with me click this link and it links to a link where you can see my calendar see when I have a free 10 minutes and if I'm available I'll Skype with you or buy you a donut whatever we'll talk for no other reason than I'm a big believer in karma and for those who think oh well you know how do you how does that translate into revenue so when I sold Harrow my company four years ago I had an idea in my head of what it was worth and the company that acquired us came back to me with a number that was much much higher and I was blown away by that. I tried not to, not to look blown away. I was like, well, maybe we can work with that. You know. um, and what I found out afterwards, and that was actually the impetus for Nice Companies Finished First, the book, what I found out is that, is that the reason it was worth more and the reason, peop the, reason the company research showed that it was worth more was because every day I was sending out emails to this audience, about a quarter million people, and they never once came from do not reply at help reporter. Every email for three, three and a half, four years I was running Harrow came from Peter at Shankman.com. And when you had a question, or you had something you wanted to talk, you just hit reply, and I answered. I spent, it, I spent probably 80% of my day answering email, because that was my job. And people, wow, the CEO of Harrow just responded to me personally, you know, as opposed to, again, making someone feel like a number. And what that did was that created a level of loyalty and a level of engagement from the readers of Harrow, that when they were asked about it by the company that was hired by the company that acquired us to find out about the company. Oh, first email I read, best thing in the world. If it doesn't come in 20 minutes, I warn the weather. They were invested in my company. You know, they were, they were, they were literally, they would have taken a bullet for, for me and for Help Reporter. And that really blew me away because that right there showed exactly how much a little tiny thing like answering an email, right. like including a smiley face. So. You know, so I'll call you a task and say, how do you scale that? But you told, I read your blog post about Google. 
can buy beer, that's a big company, you know. <laughs> right? So they obviously figured out how to scale. And, uh, if Google can do it, what the hell excuse do you have? What did you say? It was like Scott from Google or yeah. whoever is that, you know, emails. It's just like Google, Google emailed me on Saturday saying we're fixing your problem. That's like God coming down, saying not only we're fixing your problem, and by the way, you now have the ability to levitate your cat. I mean, <laughs> that was the most incredible yeah. thing in the world. So it's not scale. You know, it shows you, I think, uh, uh, to be, uh, to confess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an anthropologist, okay, so I have a certain bent that way. But I think what everyone is saying shows something which is <laughs> fundamental about human nature, even in the face of technology and everything else that's happening today. And that is, people want to experience life as if it's small scale. Socially small scale, spatially small scale, experientially small scale. In other words, you have direct access to, to people and things. Uh, you know? I, I, would, I would, can I give you one caveat to that? We want our cell phone network to work around the globe seamlessly, but when we have a problem, we want John at Verizon to fix it. That's the difference. So I'd say we want small scale when we need help. But in the global world, I want to know that whatever city, country, world I land in, everything works just like it does in my apartment. Okay, and I, I agree with you, but I would say it slightly differently. When we, when we need sort of instrumentality or functionality, then we want yep. small scale, you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think we also want sm small scale in terms of just being. You know, the experience of being a human being. You know, that has no functionality but other think than about being. Somebody like a thing. I'm just going to go back to Disney because they see just in, let's say Walt Disney World in Orlando. They see millions and millions and millions of people a year. The guests tell them because they're constantly checking in with their guests that the, one of the big things that they want from them is to be treated like an individual and to be treated special. So how do you treat millions and millions and millions pe of people? Granted, they have sixty thousand employees there. But it's impossible. So then what you have to understand is how do I make them feel like they're being treated like an individual? It, and there's a subtle difference there. But if I can make you feel like you're being treated as an individual and that you're not part of these millions of people or even just the thousands that happen to be there it's for, for the day. And, and, and it really, so I do believe you can create emotional connections. The challenge is, is that once you do that, the bar goes, they raise the bar higher and higher. It gets more and more difficult to exceed expectations each time. Right. If I go to Disney 10 times, by the 11th time, I'm expecting something super fantastic because all of the stuff you did for me these 10 times are now meeting expectations. Now I expect them from you. So what are you going to do for me the 11th time I come or the 12th time I come? And all of the premier organizations know this. I mean, these are the things that they focus on. How do I make Peter feel special if he's been to Disney 20 times, 30 times? He started coming when he's eight and now he comes and he brings his kids and his kids. You know, how, that's, the, that's the challenge it, so, once you commit to that kind, grabbing that kind of loyalty. We talked about culture and I think that would kind of be my answer is yeah. if you can tweak the culture, that's scalable. So if you tweak the culture at Disney, you know, <laughs> organically and incrementally spreads throughout the organization, you're able to scale it down to the, to the masses. I don't know. I, I, I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks about that. I mean, Tony Shea, what does he say? Uh, take care of the culture and everything else will come in your business. Well, it has to start from the top. I mean, you can't have a culture where the CEO is a douche. It has yeah, to start right. from the top and it has to, it has to work yeah, downwards. You can, but they have terrible right. service. You have to start, right. In a lot of cases. And, that, and that's where the 88 to 8 rule comes in. If 88% of the CEOs think that they're giving us amazing customer service, only 8% of the customers do, there is this massive disconnect. So the first thing you have to do is, is have the, that's why what's this, much more called a so damn successful um, undercover boss. You know, it's such an unbelievably successful show because the, the, the CEOs are, and, look, right, right. and look, when you're a CEO at a high level company, you do surround, you're surrounded just by nature by a lot of yes men, yeah. you know, who are, don't want to lose their job and want to maintain your confidence and will say pretty much whatever they have to, to continue kissing your ass. That's not the best way to work, but it's, it's something that's very hard to change. The best way to start is go into the trenches, see what's going on, be a customer, wear a hat, put a hat on your head, spend the day with your company. I've worked with companies where we've gone in and we've we've been customers, yeah. you know, and we've ordered food regularly from at the counter, and 
you sit down with the, the CEO or the VP of marketing, and he just, I remember one time we sat, it was a restaurant in about five or six um, locations across the city. And we went into two of them and we ordered the same food in each one. And not only was the food not the same as it should have been, but the, the way the order process took place was just miserable. I remember we sat down at the table and we we're unwrapping our food. And I just look over and he's just, he's just sitting there like this. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, never, I had no idea. This, I, this, he was shell-shocked. He was just, because everyone around him was, oh, numbers are great, everything's happening. And sure. he, he was floored. But I guarantee you, changes took place. Yeah, the, yes. great, the great leaders that, yeah. you know, uh, Jay Scheid, advertising, used to walk yeah. the floor, I would shake hands. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, the stories you'd hear about, you know, Walt would go down and walk Main Street and pick up garbage. And, uh, as did Michael Eisner and as does Bob yeah. Iger and Eisner, because they know it's such a huge part of the culture. And every single cast member is out there watching what they're doing. Everybody's watching you. Yeah. When you're an executive, when you're a supervisor, especially when you're in, anywhere in those leadership ranks, every single person that works for you is watching you and they're taking their cues from you. And if you say our culture is all about picking up trash, yeah. you know, we and all pick up trash, you and you it. don't do it, right. then, they, then they immediately jump to, he didn't mean it, the culture is not about picking up trash, so it's okay if I don't do that. And then you'll perpetuate that, that disintegration of the culture. United Airlines has a, has a, 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 a terminology uh, called, it's my job. And you'll see, uh, when, a, when a pilot's doing his pre-check of the plane, walking around the place the plane to look at it, you'll see he'll stop down, he'll grab a cigarette butt, he'll put it in his pocket, throw it out, whatever. You know, no job is, is too small. There's, a, there's ramp agents who, as they're leaving the airport to go home, will direct you to where, where you need to go because that's their job. And that, I think that, that, really, that really matters. And again, it's not a hard thing to do, but it has to come from the top down. Yeah, I could not agree more. Peter, maybe you have some take on this. You know, I think service is wonderful. Um, I think in some cases, brands and products now have to entertain me. Uh, gamification, uh, any thoughts on? You know what, I'm so not a fan. No. I'm really not. I, so Visa, a couple of days ago, when Brazil lost in the World Cup, Visa put out a tweet that just showed like an eight-year-old boy in the stands just staring stunned, a Brazilian kid stunned, and it was just stunned with the face and the Visa logo. And my first reaction was, come on, Visa, that kid, an eight-year-old kid, you didn't need to have to tweet him out. That's, that's not cool. Yeah. But secondly, what the f does stunned have to do with the Visa brand other than looking at my bill every month and I'm stunned? <laughs> How is that in any way, shape, or form? Probably, Thank you, Visa. I'll get my World Cup scores and reactions from TV. I don't need it for a credit card, for Christ's sake. <laughs> right. Companies are trying, trying way too hard to be my friend. Yeah. You know, you don't need to be my friend because, quite frankly, we want, it's nice to have, look, companies issue press releases, people tweet, okay? And when, it, when Visa is tweeting about, you know, wow, that was an amazing game, you know, I, I can pretty much guarantee you that my Visa card has never looked at me and said that was an amazing game. But for some reason on Twitter, they're doing that. I don't know, and I, I don't see how that's beneficial in the slightest. Well, it's, the, it's, business it's doc, the business doctrine nowadays, and probably always has been, uh, good communication is informative and entertaining. Mm -hmm. uh, I think again that that's commodity. You know, uh, you really want to build an emotional attachment. You you have to present some underlying. You have to couple some underlying insight into human nature and human behavior and human longing, and couple that to good storytelling. You know, that's what it required. That's what's required. Not not this ridiculous thing that yeah. is such an appropriate example of what you just said. Well, and the, it's a classic example of this disconnect of companies not understanding what customers really want, and they're out there trying to be all things to all people. And the fact is, if you're a credit card company, I want you to do that really, right. really well right. for me. Right. I don't care if you tweet about the World Cup, and you know, it's, I'm probably the only person on the planet who didn't care about the World Cup in the first place. You know, not a sport. Sports fans, sorry, don't no, throw things no, at me, it. okay? Uh, you know, all the f furor over this just made me go, really, people, you've got nothing to do than this? I'm, you know, I'm swamped. You've got nothing to do but this? But anyway, I digress. <laughs> so the, so the, the idea that they have to be all things to all people just shows how disconnected they are. You're Whatever so you right. do, You're I so want right. you to do it for me, do it really, really well. Ritz Carlton, I follow Ritz Carlton's Twitter uh, feed and Four Seasons yeah. Twitter feed. You know what they do? Every day they assign 
Twitter ownership every day to a different hotel within their properties. And what that hotel will do is tweet out photos and videos and things like that from that property. And I can't see one of these tweets and not be like, okay, gotta go there now. You know, my office really sucks. I want to be in Bora Bora right now. They do such a good job of making me want to go to their property. Starwood does it wow. just as well. Because you know what? You know what? When I look at Rich Carlton, you know what I imagine being, when I imagine seeing? I imagine seeing hotels. Uh, when I look at Visa, I don't imagine seeing the freaking World Cup. <laughs> so, right. so, so the, the hotels right. are getting it right. They're, they're making yeah. me want their product. That's right. There's nothing about the World Cup that makes me want to go get a credit card. <laughs> there just isn't. I find it very interesting, and that is, when a person has a deep emotional connection with a brand, a product, a company, the language that they use to talk about right. that changes from what I would call prose to poetry. Hmm. For example, I can only paraphrase because I, I didn't memorize this quote, but I'll give you a fairly good close uh, to a cl quote. Um, I'm doing some work for telephone service provider and so I'm speaking to people about that and um, of course nowadays people one way or the other no matter how you talk about that someone many of them are going to talk about Apple iPhones sure. so a person says to me uh, the iPhone like Apple is a circle so already I'm saying to myself, what? <laughs> right? But he didn't say that. He says, the Apple-like iPhone is a circle. This is the way he says it. It glides. It's easy. It's soft. It helps me do things better, faster, and be a bigger me. All other cell phones, smartphones, are a, a box. A box. They, they have corners. They're squared off. Then he points to me and yells at me. They're too corporate. <laughs> and they don't really have any way of understanding me or how I do things. The Apple iPhone helps me be more of me. And that's why it's the only iPhone I would ever. I just want to go, go to whoever this person is. I want to smack the crap out of them. <laughs> so I mean, I, th I thought I was the only person have, on the planet that didn't have an iPhone. When you have someone talking about your product, no matter what the product is. I do not have an iPhone. As opposed to from, yeah. it's a circle, it's not a box. It's like, well, that, that happens all the time. <laughs> when you really have deep emotional connection with a product. Right. Yeah. People yeah. don't talk about, yeah. people do not talk about it in terms of attributes. Oh, my, my nephew Attributes said, are gone. that's true. My nephew said, I would die without my iPhone. That's what he said. And now, I don't buy into that personally. You know, I, I'll tell you right up. I have a Blackberry and, and I have a new Blackberry Z10. I love it. And I that's never so had cute. an iPhone. So, you know, that's, and I, years ago, I read an article that said, if you want a phone for work, you get a Blackberry. If you want a phone for fun and play, you get, you get an iPhone. I don't watch movies. I don't play music I don't I work on my phone that's all I need it for my four email addresses and my yeah, I'm, my work I'm not asking you, that, you know I ask you to do for me to do it well yes, that that exactly so I'm happy with that but Bob's right there whether you agree or not the emotional connection to certain products and brands oh, yeah. such as iPhone is is often expressed that way people express themselves that way all the time when they talk about Disney you know um, you said it when you talk about Ritz I see Ritz I want to go to a I want to go to a hotel it, so we do speak like that yeah. for the brands that we become emotionally attached to. And the great thing is we tell other people. Yeah. Well, that's the key. We and tell and other that's people. where we're going yeah. in this conversation economy. Again, mm -hmm. in 48 months, you know, when I'm getting all of my advice automatically based on where I am geographically, based on where my phone knows that I am, and based on who the people in my network who I interact with the most are, that's where this becomes magical because then all the only difference, the only differentiating factor is gonna be customer service. Right. So that, you know, that's interesting to go back to that because you talked about that earlier, the, the, not about my likes and my followers, and you know, it's about that um, profile. It's not created <clears throat> things I fill out, how old I am, where I come from, it's all the people- It's what I do in the real world. That construct my profile. That's what I do in the real world. I mean, a company nowadays is not in control of their message anymore. <coughs> and they still want to be and they still think they are. Yeah. You know, if you look at, <clears throat> a perfect example, I always use the, the, the walking into a bar example. I go into a bar, I sit down, and in, in, this, in this alternate universe in my head, I'm not married. So I go into this bar, I sit down, <laughs> and I meet this girl. Okay. Today, I'd, I'd get her number, I'd get her email, I'd email her, we'd email a couple times. I'd, 
request a friend her on Facebook. Maybe she'd agree, maybe she wouldn't. We'd start talking, eventually, okay. In 24 months, I'm gonna meet someone, we're gonna text back and forth. The sentiment of that text is gonna be positive. Hey, great meeting you. Hey, Peter, you too, hope to see you again. Touch points one and two. I text her a couple days later, hey, you wanna go grab a drink? It was really, you know, have another drink, it was really great. I'd love to hang out with you. And, yeah, I'd love to, great, I'll see you tonight. Touch points three and four. While we're having a drink, I said, you wanna get dinner on Friday night? She goes, sure. I go on an open table, uh, which is now bought by, uh, who bought open table, Expedia? Oh, I don't know. Someone, yeah, open table was acquired about two weeks ago. I think by, by Travel Austin, one of them. Um, I go on an open table, I make a reservation, her and my name. When we show up at the restaurant, that's touch point seven and eight. When we sit down and we're done with our dinner, that's touch point nine and 10. At touch point 10, the network says, okay, they're friends. I don't need to friend request her. So if I'm going to this restaurant three times, if I go on a same airline, there's my loyalty. It's there because in the real world, that's what I'm doing. So the companies need to be aware that the only way they're gonna be able to market to me is based on the experience I'm having, the experience my friends are having, and how we're sharing that information with each other. That authentic experience. I really experience. believe that, yeah, that authentic it's experience. It's about not making authenticity, which we all talk about. I wanna create an authentic experience. What's Just the, what's focus on being one level above like, crap. Create authentic. Right. Yeah. I don't know that those two are <laughs> together, right? That's right. But that's what we're all trying so to trying, do. We want to make something viral. Just make something good. Right. Yeah. Just make something right. good. It'll go viral by the fall. Trust me. In, in this context that you're talking about, the, the mobile digital world, so to speak, I, I think one new task that companies have is, um, from my point of view, I would say it this way, how how do I, company X, enter another person's narrative? Mm. Yeah. You know, it's not like, okay, here's my story, I'm gonna put it out. You know, or here's your story, I, you know, that's what you are. It's how we can sort of co-author together yeah. something that we both rise up with and from. And that's a, that's a different task it is. than yeah. just putting something out. It, first, it requires good listening. Yep. First, it re, second, it requires you understand how to analyze, comprehend what you're listening to and what you've heard. It's a new business. It is. And that's actually, I was going to sum it up that you know, one of the things that's the biggest challenge for advertising and marketing agencies right now is not creating the solution, it is more finding what's relevant uh, and creating that story. And again, both of these, both of those things sound cliche, hmm. but creating relevance and entering that story, both of those things, again, it's like that creating authentic experience. It's it's a paradox. I mean, well, I don't want to get you off of paradox, but uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful perspective on paradox. <laughs> that it has to be, it has to exist to be truly creative. So I think, I think you know, the big challenge right now is not, um, uh, you know, as everyone running scared, is trying to figure out what we're supposed to do. We don't even know what we're supposed to do. You know, what's the, where does research sit? Am I just trying to find out who the people are that I'm trying to target? No, I need to learn a lot more about who they are and what do they do and what matters to them. Very tall order. And it, it, it's a tall order, but in one sense, it's it's simply stated. You know, get people right, and remember your people too. Yep. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which kind of reinforces what you say. Just yeah. let it happen, and uh -huh. then you know you'll be friends. Well, uh, I want to thank you all for coming down today. I really appreciate the time. It's been great, and hopefully, if I can come up with another interesting topic, come back again sometime soon. Anytime. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's it for Buzz Bubble. We'll see you again soon.